Let me take your seats, thank you. Uh, Johnny, that was not such a bad accident. I'm reminded of um, the uh, launch of the new Siskai flag. Um, when the Siskai was established as, a, as an independent republic. Um, and uh, many of us have this image still in our heads of as the, the new anthem of the Siskai is sung, um, and as the flag is drawn up, so the flagpole comes down. <laughs> it was quite a, a situation, <laughs> very ominous situation. So, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sunny uh, Bonani. Good afternoon, dames and gentlemen. It's a very special privilege and a great honor to, to welcome you this evening um, to Professor Brendan Shaw's professorial inaugural lecture. Um, as we know, as most of us know, this has been a long time in the making. Uh, but we are delighted and pleased and very honored to be part of the ceremony this evening. So allow me then to recognize Professor Andre Swart, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences. Of course, Professor Brandon Shaw, very special colleague and guest, Professor Johnny Mahlangu, who's the head of the School of Pathology at the University of the Witwatersrand. I want to say Johnny tongue in cheek, comma, Johannesburg. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, to acknowledge senior leaders of the university, I know in particular Professor Saurabh Sina, who is the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Built Environment, and our Vice Deans who are present, Dr. Nala Singh, apologies, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Shahid Nala, what happened with me there now, Shahid? <laughs> um, the Vice Dean in the Faculty of Health Sciences. Uh, I also see another engineer in the house, uh, Professor Charles Mboa, the Vice Dean in the Faculty of Engineering in the Built Environment. Um, I understand uh, that Andre uh, Swart is having um, a bit of schizophrenia when he sees the engineers in the house because he says he's not sure if this is still his faculty. <laughs> that is health sciences. Uh, so other colleagues, uh, members of Senate, other academics, and of course our colleagues from our peer institutions, especially here in Gauteng, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Allow me also, of course, to single out um, Brandon's partner and wife, Professor Ina Shaw, um, a warm welcome to you because I'm certain this is also a very special moment for you. And uh, uh, please accept our appreciation. So it's always a great honor and a very special privilege for, for me to welcome you to uh, Professorial inaugural lecture, and so I express a warm welcome to his loved ones, his special guests, and colleagues. Um, this is indeed a proud, a joyful moment, a landmark moment for all of us. Of course, so for Professor Shaw, but also, and for all of us here at the university, in higher education in South Africa and beyond. I say this because. The office of professor is carried across our world. And so as we celebrate him this evening, we celebrate him in the acknowledgement and in the recognition that this is a celebration that reverberates into the world and into eternity. As we know, inaugurations many a times pompous and decadent, mostly dignified, well-meaning and unsullied, 
we're told date at least in recent times to ancient Greece as the opportunity for the formal investiture of a person into a high office and it marks the formal assumption of office or position of authority. Of course we say tongue-in-cheek uh, four years later and respectfully so sir. And so that today is that day that marks the rites of passage and the entry, at least in a ceremonial manner, of Professor Shaw into the distinguished community of university's most senior scholars. This is a high office and a position of authority and leadership which we shall not assume lightly, but shall do so with considerable and ongoing thought reflection, deliberation, and dare I add, presence of mind, something which apparently is uh, in very low supply at the moment, whether you're in South Africa, in the United States, or elsewhere. <clears throat> and so the professorial inauguration is as important to the incumbent and their loved ones and colleagues as it is to the university. I say since this, since the inaugural lecture, is as much a reflection on the state of the and the intent of the contemporary university and how it measures up to Professor Shaw's inaugural lecture on resistance exercise is medicine. And so when we listen to Professor Shaw this evening, not only do we learn and explore his expertise, we also learn about the contemporary university, this university, and the state of universities in South Africa, on our continent, and in our world. Because on these auspicious occasions, I often remark on Vartan Gregorian's hopefulness and controversy when he suggests that Universities are not only repositories of past human endeavor, they are instruments of civilization. Holtz continues that they provide tools for learning, for understanding, and for progress, and that they are the wellspring of action, a source of self-renewal, of intellectual growth, and of hope. And he concludes they are a medium of progress, of autonomy, of empowerment, of independence, and of self-determination. At the same time, I remind us of Wernick's argument that, and I quote, the university has a contradictory relationship with its surrounding society. On the one side, the autonomy in terms of its axial values of capitalism, of science, and so on. And on the other hand, he continues, those who control the means of material production control the means of mental production. And the dominant ideas are the ideas of those who dominate. And of Edward Said in his presentations of the intellectual reminds us, and I quote, the role of the intellectual cannot be played without a sense of being someone whose place it is publicly to raise embarrassing questions to confront orthodoxy and dogma rather than to reproduce them, to be someone who cannot easily be co-opted by governments or corporations and whose raison d'etre is to represent all those peoples and issues that are routinely forgotten or swept under the carpet." End of quotation. I'm also reminded that very few books are available in decent bookstores and what it is to be a professor, and in particular, what the freedoms and duties of this most senior scholar of the university is. I was reflecting on this last night as I was preparing my, my reflections, or brief reflections, that it seems to be the case, uh, uh, Professor Swart, that it's a case of observation and learn as you go. Um, and it seems to me that that places enormous responsibility on the executive dean and the heads of departments and heads of schools to play the role that they should be 
in inducting this most senior uh, colleague um, into the office, the very high office of the professor. And so I offer us the very briefly reflections of Bruce McFarlane, who is a distinguished visiting professor here at the University of Johannesburg, who in his book, Intellectual Leadership in Higher Education, renewing the role of the university professor, seeks to correct this oversight and argues, in my view, convincingly that given the corporatization of the research agenda, professors must reclaim professorial, professorial leadership and that they thus occupy a very special role. Specifically, he argues the two freedoms, that of critic and advocate, are essential for professors to execute what he calls their four duties, being those of mentor, of guardian of standards, of an enabler of networking, and a mobilizer of resources for others, and fourthly, of being an ambassador for the institution or for the discipline. And so this evening we will only have one small insight into how Professor Shaw responds to this call for the return of professorial leadership. And I now invite the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, Professor Andre Swat, to introduce Professor Shaw to us. I thank you. Thank you, Vice-Chancellor. Let me also echo a warm word, warm word of welcome to everybody here this evening. We really appreciate the time you're present being here. Allow me to extend a special word of welcome to Ina. It's lovely having you here. You know, it's also a very special occasion to you. Professor Mishlongo, having you with us, we're honored to have you with us here tonight. Vice-Chancellor, it's now my privilege to introduce Professor Shaw to the audience here tonight. Brandon Shaw is the Vice Dean, Research, Innovation and Postgraduate Studies of the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Johannesburg and was appointed as a full professor in the Department of Sport and Movement Studies on 1 April 2013. I'm not sure about the 1 April, but we'll, we'll get around to that at a later stage. He previously held academic appointments as a lecturer, senior lecturer, and the youngest ever associate professor in the history of the Swane University of Technology or its constituent institutions. Prof. Shaw has also been appointed by the Minister of Health as one of the 16 board members of the South African Medical Research Council, whose role it is to regulate good governance of the Medical Research Council and to advise the Minister on critical concerns within the medical landscape. Prof. Shaw is an honorary research fellow at Monash University, South Africa campus, and adjunct full professor at the University of Venda internationally, Professor Shaw currently serves as the Executive Director for Africa and is the Vice President of Publications and Communications for the International Physical Activity Projects. He is also a Professional Education Committee member of the American College of Sports Medicine, which is the largest sport medicine and exercise science organization globally. As a South African National Research Foundation rated researcher with a focus on circumvention of cardiopulmonary disease through physical activity, he has authored over 150 peer-reviewed national and international journal publications and numerous other publications with researchers from Africa, Asia, Europe, the Middle East and North and South America. One such publication is invited contribution to a chapter for UNESCO's Encyclopedia of Life Support Systems on Sports Science and Physical Education. He has authored or co-authored over 70 conference presentations and has been invited to deliver presentations in Africa, Asia, U Europe and North America. Since cardiopulmonary disease are ranked as number 4 to 7 within the top 10 mortality associated diseases in South Africa, following only tuberculosis, influenza and pneumonia, as well as HIV, Prof. Shaw has attempted to reduce the burden of these associated with cardiopulmonary disease using physical activity. However, while much known aerobic modes of physical activity, little or no research exists on the alternative modes of physical activity, such as pilates, calisthenics and resistance training, 
And it is this novel approach that the research focuses upon. His research has won several awards and led to his research being featured on national and international radio programs and in national and international popular magazines, such as Women's World Prevention, Runner's World and Muscle and Fitness. Prof. Schur has served on eight international scientific <coughs> peer review journal editorial boards, including ETA, Kinesiologica, Advances in Physical Education, the Gavin Journal of Opedic Research and Therapy, Global Journal of Human Social Sciences, the International Journal of Therapy and Rehabilitation, formerly the British Journal of Therapy and Rehabilitation, the Revista Pesquia in Physiotherapia, Sports Sciences, and the ASCM's Health and Fitness Journal, which is the official journal of the American College of Sport Medicine, which is the largest sport medicine and exercise science organization globally. Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, I now call on Professor Shaw to address us on resistance exercise in medicine. Professor Shaw, please. Vice Chancellor, Executive Dean, Faculty of Health Sciences, Professor Johnny Mathlanger, Executive Dean, Faculty of Engineering, Built Environment, colleagues from the University of Johannesburg, colleagues and friends from outside of the University of Johannesburg, masters and PhD students, and finally to my co-chair of the Shaw Research Unit, also known as the Shaw Household. Thank you very much for, your, for availing yourselves for this presentation this evening. Now, the idea of resistance exercise or exercise as a global, as medicine, is a global initiative that's actually come about really recently. And what it is, is health professionals trying to encourage the use of exercise as a form of treatment. And the problem with that is while we try and promote exercise, it seems to tend to only promote one type of exercise. That's aerobic exercise. Everyone knows about this. This is the 10,000 step idea. Irrespective of the intensity, the major medical aids are moving towards that. So it keeps promoting, it should almost be aerobic exercise as medicine. But this presentation is going to try and move towards including more holistic approach, including resistance type training. Now, I'm not going to move to the embarrassing questions that the Vice Chancellor is talking about and ask you how many of these fictitious beliefs that you have about resistance training. And this is why people are avoiding, and you can think of this yourself and why health professionals are avoiding resistance type training. The first one is aerobic training burns more fat than resistance training. And I'll come to this in much more depth a little bit later. Resistance training is not useful for overweight and obese patients or clients. Muscle gained during resistance training will turn to fat if stopped. That one's a very common one in South Africa. And let me tell you, that's completely impossible. If someone can turn fat to muscle, I'd like to invite them to my house because I've got a lot of wood that needs to be turned to gold. <laughs> then resistance training is bad for bones and joints. Also a very common one, but again, equally fictitious. Resistance training will make an individual look muscle bound. Just like that bureaumoth in the top left hand corner, your top right hand corner. Now everyone has this perception if they pick up a weight, in a month's time they're going to look like that. I can tell you that is completely fictitious and this goes especially to the females where they refuse to do weight because they're scared they develop a bump somewhere in their body, develop a muscle. And then equally fictitious but not as laughable is resistance training as dangerous. And the most common one we hear is that resistance training increases blood pressure. It's a, a genuine concern amongst health professionals and overweight and people with high blood pressure or hypertension. Now I'm going to delve a little bit into the, the, the dangerous aspect, the so-called dangerous aspect of resistance training. Now, all physical activity, not just resistance training, actually increases your risk of developing a, a diverse event, such as cardiac sudden death, myocardial infarction or heart attack, or, or even just a simple muscle strain, any type, whether it's resistance training, aerobic training, flexibility, whatever it is. And I think everyone's very well versed on what happens commonly during the, the Comrades Marathon with people running so-called aerobic, the safer version, develop heart attacks. Then also resistance training, obviously as with lifting any heavy object is going to have a problem. 
you are gonna you have the potential to develop either musc musculoskeletal muscle joint injuries or a heart attack and it includes picking up something at home it doesn't have to be resistance training and by the way that is a form of resistance training and then what is also quite laughable is when we talk about injuries developed from resistance training most of the injuries we see are as a result of people dropping weights on themselves that's the most common injury we do find and obviously resistance training as is many other cases or many types of training can increase your blood pressure that's a fact but so does aerobic training now resistance training increases blood pressure when you hold your breath we call it the valsalva maneuver where the top the glottis of your throat closes you hold that blood you hold your your breath in and all the blood vessels actually go into stasis they hold the blood pressure and that's the dangerous part so if you can circumvent that during resistance training you actually reduce that temporary or acute risk so there are ways around that and most of the injuries that we find including the dropping of the weights on yourselves or that increased valsalva maneuver come from lifting excessive weights and I had to put that picture in there where they try and bend that bar and then they develop an injury or a heart attack and they wonder why and I'm not even going to say anything about him not having shoes on or they train the same muscle group day in day out and I think we've seen this in press especially Professor Swart has seen this when he goes to the the university gym and especially the first years of training it's always arm day Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday and Friday is arm day and they wonder why they develop injuries so it's these type of myths and problems that are not being considered by laypersons and the health, prof health professionals themselves that is actually resulting in people avoiding doing resistance training and also the, the so-called professional, the health professional, in actually prescribing this treatment that could actually benefit the person. Now, when I talk about the resist types of resistance training, this is those, the classic ones that we know about and I'll come to them a little bit later. But everyone has this perception, I'm sure many of you had that perception when you saw my title. When we spoke about resistance training, you, you either thought about that gigantic human being or you thought about heavy weights. And those are the perceptions that most people have. And that perception is still pervasive today. But resistance training was not even used for athletic, improving athletic performance till the 1950s. And it wasn't even included in adult fitness programs just developing general conditioning until the 1970s. And even this American College of Sports Medicine that you've already heard about, that's the biggest organization in the world, in its original position statement, actually didn't include resistance training. So if a large organization like that and many others omit resistance training, surely that means that resistance training is not important or there's a reason you should not be doing it. And this has actually moved over from this oversimplification of that when you do weights, it's as heavy as possible, as low reps as possible, and that's the only way you can do it. Now, I want to just emphasize that resistance training is not strength training. It's completely two different um, types of training, and actually strength training is a subgroup of resistance training and I just want to go through the four main classic groups that that exist out there and I'm going to talk specifically about an athletic population we have the strength training and this is about 85 percent of your one repetition maximum now I'm going to take a second there what one repetition maximum is so if I said hundred percent of your one repetition maximum it's how much you can lift successfully for once the heaviest you can have if you can do two that's not your hundred so this is 85% of what you can lift once. And that's the general perception everyone has about resistance training. Then there's also power training, which is 75 to 85% of your maximum. But obviously that's done at, at, at a much faster speed. Then we move to hypertrophy training. And this is the most popular one in the campus gyms. This is the one where we talk about hypertrophy, it's an increase in muscle mass. So this is what they're trying to achieve. And this is about 67 to 85% of the maximum that they can lift. Then the final one is muscular endurance training. And that's 67% and much lower with much higher repetitions. But I want to move away from that paradigm. And we're going to talk about resistance exercise as a treatment or prevention of chronic diseases, musculoskeletal injuries. 
And if you look at that continuum there, you actually see, yes, strength is mainly developed at the, at the lower repetitions, meaning more weights. But it can be developed right through the spectrum, all the way down to very low repetition. So that will be more beneficial when you're trying not to have that Valsalva maneuver with a, a high-risk patient. Look at hypertrophy. So even if you're doing very heavy weights, doing to very low weights, you will still develop some muscle mass. And I'm going to go into the, the benefits of developing muscle mass later. And the same for muscular endurance, you'll see it also exists on the continuum, even if you're doing very heavy weights. Now, the benefits of resistance training for musculoskeletal injury. And when I'm talking about musculoskeletal injury, I'm talking about injuries to the, the skeleton, the joints, as well as the muscles. Now, until recently, resistance training we know has been used very successfully with injury rehabilitation. So once they've had an injury, they're going to the gym, they use fancy equipment, resistance type training, they rehabilitate from that injury. But we also know that it can assist in the prevention of musculoskeletal injuries and even reduce this, the severity. So even if once you've developed an injury, if you had been engaging in resistance training beforehand, you'll actually recover, return to your occupation, return to activities of daily living, uh, return to sport much sooner than you would have. And the reason for this is if you have a look at the effects of resistance training on muscles, bones, and connective tissue. And I just want to point something out, especially for Professor Johnny Mflunger. Just on that figure, we're not actually saying that resistance training can improve areolar connective tissue. <laughs> now, I'm going to move to the, the specifics of how resistance training works. When we talk about muscular adaptation, resistance training has a lot of effects on the muscle itself. And the one thing that it does help with is if you've got increased strength, so now you move to the paradigm of doing more resistance type training, you move to the slightly heavier weight, it'll actually result in less fibers being used during normal simple events. So you will actually have less fibers being activated, less fibers being susceptible to your injuries. Then if you increase your functional ability, your ability to perform ADLs through strength, Meaning, you can walk upstairs a lot easier. You can carry your, your groceries much more easily. You're not going to develop those simple injuries and put yourself out of, out of occupation or physical activity. Then strength and power training. Remember that power training was the, the, the faster movement at quite high loads. Um, it results in a much higher maximal effort. So should that, the need arise where you need to overcome high forces externally, you have that ability. So mean you can match the demands of what's happening. Then hypertrophied muscles. So yes, the reason why you need to have some muscle, ladies, especially if I'm talking to you. You need to have muscles because it better able supports metabolism. So when your metabolism is better, you actually recover much better from injuries. You heal faster, even from minor breakdown and even from your major injuries that you develop. And this increased soft muscle mass or the soft tissue will actually absorb impact from direct trauma. It dissipates that force. Now, I'm also going to say very tongue in cheek, fat mass does the same. <laughs> now, one very unique ability is resistance training can improve muscle balance or muscle imbalance. And the way it does is it can improve agonist and antagonist meaning the muscle that does the work versus the muscle at the back that's trying to stop it. So it creates a much more symbiotic relationship. So this muscle at the back is not trying to always resist this movement you're trying to do. And also, it helps with the left and the right. So your left doesn't become much stronger than your, or your right doesn't become much stronger than your left, and you don't develop imbalances on this side, and it always dominates the, the opposite or the contralateral side. Then, when I talk about the connective tissue adaptations, I'm going to talk specifically about the tendons and the ligaments. Now, the tendons themselves actually connect the muscle to the bone, whereas the ligaments connect uh, bone to bone. And those are actually how the body puts the force through the skeletal system. And if you can increase strength 
and do resistance type training, you actually improve your anti-gravity muscles. Those are your postural muscles that keep you upright. So if you can keep yourself upright, move a lot better, you're going to be less susceptible to falling, upright type of injuries. And resistance training in, in, in lieu of aerobic training can actually create much more intensity because when you're doing aerobic type training, you're only using your body weight. So how do you increase the weight or the load or the volume? The, the way you do that is you add external weight to the body. And resistance training equally to, to aerobic training is you can actually make it load bearing. But the problem with aerobic training, how do you make your arms load bearing? In those type of exercises. So resistance training will, will do that much more successfully. And research is finding that your collagen content in your connective tissue is actually related to the increase in muscle size. Again, there's that importance of hypertrophy. Ladies, I'm gonna keep picking on you tonight about this. Because it's the ladies that are very adverse. They, real, they would rather be thin with no muscle mass, but that's actually counterproductive to what I'm saying. Yes, Emma, that includes you as well with all the aerobic training. <laughs> then with bone tissue adaptation, thankfully bone has the ability to remodel and adapt. Now how it does this? It, re it responds to two particular stresses. It responds to mechanical load, meaning the amount of weight placed on it, or muscular activity, meaning the muscle contractions. Now, the problem with this is higher bone mass needs to be there before an injury happens. So if you anticipate an injury, very important for sports, it makes sense to increase your bone mass because you're anticipating an injury. It's not always good to plan for it, but it needs to be in place. So if you get that injury and you create a fracture, you've got much more bone mass to lose. So you start at a high level, and if you lose some, it's fine. It's better than starting at a low level and you lose everything. And also extremely important in conditions like osteoporosis. So if the ladies have very low bone mass, more likely to cause fractures and breaks. Then um, with the exercise types, we find that resistance training far outweighs the other types of, of training, such as aerobic training, in that it creates the most effective bone building effect just because of the increased loads. And I'm coming to the specific load now. Now, resistance training, this is for the, the executive dean of Phoebe, he loves the numbers. Resistance training increases bone de mineral density by as much as one to three percent. Now you'd say that's not much. But that one, one to three percent actually reduces the risk of osteoporosis, bone fractures, um, micro fractures, and other bone deteriorating conditions. So it's got a wide application. Then also, these adaptations are site specific. Meaning, if you're doing contractions on your, say your upper arm, your biceps, those contractions are limited to that upper arm bone, the humerus. It's not gonna transfer to the lower leg. So again, think of your aerobic type training. It usually involves the lower body. So where's that bone osteogenic benefit of the upper body? if you do not do resistance training. Now, bone mass, when I talk about the mechanical load, increases into, at a specific rate, it's well known, and that rate is one RM to 10 RM. Now, if you remember, one RM is how much you can lift successfully once, up to how many, how many times you can lift a weight 10 times successfully. Now, aerobic training definitely doesn't involve that. It involves much more repetitions. So, Resistance training, fantastic for the minimal essential strain. Then with neural adaptations, we're finding that resistance training has such an effect at all the way from the muscle, the neuromuscular junction, all the way up to the central nervous system. It creates changes all the way along there. And just for interest sake, resistance training actually increases the, the diameter of the axon, meaning more neurotransmitters can actually move down along that, that increased diameter of that axon, creating much more, much better quality of contraction. Extremely important for something like multiple sclerosis. Then the adaptations are really important because this, uh, this neural drive allows you to take that muscle mass, that strength, and apply it in a much more rapid, rapid manner. Now, 
I'm going to move away from the, the musculoskeletal injuries and move to your chronic conditions and diseases. Now, this is where exercise as medicine is coming in, is that resistance training has actually been promoted in the prevention and rehabilitation of chronic diseases. Now, obviously, those high resistance training exercises I was talking about, your strength training, your power training, is actually not going to be appropriate. Think of that continuum I was talking about. But your low or moderate intensity will actually give you benefits. And the, the prevention we're actually finding is much better than aerobic training, even though aerobic training continues to be the gold standard. Again, I'm going to refer to the 10,000 steps. <clears throat> now, my address is going to focus specifically on the fourth to seventh ranked diseases in South Africa, or the causes of mortality. Just if you have a look at cerebrovascular disease, 4.9 percent of, of deaths in 2013 in South Africa. Diabetes, 4.8. Other forms of heart disease, 4.6 percent. Hypertensive, 3.7, and that's a collective 18 percent. That's large. Almost one fifth of the population is dying from those four diseases. These diseases are actually only behind TB, um, influenza, and pneumonia, and HIV. But what's important to, to do when you're looking at any treatment, whether it's exercise or a specific medication, is to look at what are the causes of those diseases. Don't treat the, the disease itself, treat the cause. Whether they've developed the disease or they're moving towards developing the disease. And I'm going to talk specifically about hypertension. It's the major risk factor globally for disease. And I think you just noticed that there that it's actually a, an independently ranked disease on its own. Now resistance training actually increases blood pressure. And I was talking to one of my colleagues this morning as well, is even though there's that, that transient or that immediate increase in blood pressure while you're lifting and holding your breath, as soon as that valsalva goes away, because of that effect of pushing on those blood vessels, it actually keeps those blood vessels slightly wider than they would have been at rest for, as soon as you've left put that weight down and it actually reduces blood pressure immediately during resistance training and this acute effect lasts for up to nine hours following resistance type training so fantastic people with blood pressure although there's a risk this benefit outweighs it because it gives it immediate protection and in the long term will actually give even more protection than aerobic training would and it's become so, such a good treatment for people with high blood pressure or hypertension that the ACSM is actually recommending it already for an adjunct treatment. This is an adjunct treatment to medication and dietary intervention. Now, with this lipidemia, a lot of you will notice hypercholesteremia. And it's actually an increased cholesterol, that's what most people would know, or an increased LDL, which is your bad cholesterol, increased triglycerides, which is the fats in your blood, or a decreased good cholesterol. Now, when you look at this, you need to look at the effect of any exercise or any treatment, whether it's drug or not, and how it impacts on those, those four constituents of cholesterol. And we're finding that reductions as low as 0 0.6 millimoles, and just to tell you what is normal, normal is 5.2 millimoles of total cholesterol. So even a reduction of 0 0.6 millimoles in total, just the total cholesterol, actually reduces your incidence of ischemic heart disease by 54%. That's huge. That's large numbers. Meaning, any improvement is going to reduce your risk. So, when we talk about cardiovascular medicine, this is the gold standard that everyone tries to do. Even if they haven't got very high levels, just by reducing it slightly, even if it is normal, will reduce the incidence of, of ischemic and other heart diseases. Now, research is demonstrating that your increased volume of movement with resistance training. So again, look at this. This is really important. It's not about the weight. It's about your sets and your repetitions that are actually going to improve your, your cholesterol levels. Not how heavy you're lifting. It's the quality of movement. Then overweight and obesity. I'm not going to get into this one in South Africa at the moment. But it's increasing dramatically. Globally, South Africa, you just have to look around and you can see the numbers are increasing. And this risk factor increases other risk factors. Your dyslipidemia, your, your hypertension, 
your diabetes, your risk for developing diabetes, all of those will increase just from having this risk factor. And resistance training, we're finding decreases fat mass. Yes, so does aerobic training. But resistance training is especially good at reducing the abdominal fat, which is the bad fat. That's the worst one to have. Thanks to the ladies, have the protect, protective fat around the hips. Men, it's yeah, that's the dangerous fat. Also your visceral fat, that's the fat around the organs. But what is unique to this type of, of exercise is that resistance training increases lean body mass. So your muscle mass will improve. And it occurs very importantly, even in the absence of changes in your diet. So even if you eat equally badly, I'm not saying please do that, but if you eat equally badly as you would have, and you just engage in resistance training, your body fat will drop, muscle mass will go up. Then, a loss of 1.8 to 2.7 kilo kilograms of lean body mass will be lost after 30 years of age. So all of you people here, that at over 30 years of age, you're losing lean mass. And when you lose that lean mass, your metabolic rate is going to drop at the same time. <clears throat> then, another risk factor is insulin resistance or diabetes, and you saw that was an independent risk factor itself. And resistance training, again, unique ability, not aerobic training, to improve muscle metabolic properties. This is because of that increase in hypertrophy. And when you've got more muscle mass and you eat something, your body actually has a fantastic response to that glucose and will convert it to a usable energy instead of to body fat. Now, I've spoken about the increased muscle mass. There's a saying that uh, fat burns in a furnace of muscle. So if you do not have muscle mass, you're not going to burn body fat. It cannot happen. And a 10% increase in muscle mass, look at the numbers again, the, the executive dean from Phoebe, 10% increase in lean mass results in an 11% reduction in insulin resistance. So you become more resistant to insulin, meaning you need less insulin to do the same job of taking glucose out of the blood. And I'm pausing for effect here. <laughs> so with diet, any disease prevention program or rehabilitation program has to focus on a negative energy balance. And I'm going to put this simply. Eat less. Exercise more. That's the way you create the energy balance. There's nothing scientific, nothing convoluted about this approach. And we know that exercise, any form of exercise, will affect carbohydrate, protein, and fat metabolism. That's well known. That's known from the 50s. But what we're finding is exercise might actually affect what the people are eating. But we're also finding it actually has a neuro, neurological effect. And specifically, we're finding that resistance training results in a, a, a favorable diet intake of the macronutrients, meaning you'll move more towards a carbohydrate away from a fat. Now, I'm going to say something that might be very despondent to the females. We're finding that when you engage in resistance training as a male, it actually suppresses your, your, your drive to eat. As a female, it actually forces you to go home and eat. So we're having a, a bit of a problem. It obviously has been researched, mate, but why am I saying this? Is the female should resist that urge to go home and replace the calories have just burnt with resistance training and actually try not to eat. It's actually just your nervous system. And, and Emma's fantastic. Now, it was already alluded to in my, my conclusions, is that many health professionals continue to drive this aerobic type training, walk, run, and it's very limiting on the benefit that it can generate. Because, um, and I'm going to go back to the 10 steps. One of the major is promoting 10,000 steps. At what intensity? And I'm, I've coined a... I haven't published it yet because I think I'm going to meet, it, meet some resistance. I talk about the walk one, lick one phenomenon. And that we see it with our students. They may be walking these great distances to the university. But the lick one. 
and at what intensity? The walking in a slow way possible is really beneficial to the exercise. So by keep promoting irrespective of the productive health. So we use resistance training and studies are coming out that it actually gives us unique benefits because it gives us unique benefits. It's actually getting the benefits of aerobic training. It complements them and actually brings about those benefits at a much faster rate. We talk about your concurrent your combination and because of this ever mounting evidence that I've just spoken about, many organizations such as the National Strength Conditioning Association are actually developing guidelines on how resistance training can be used to specific aspects of health. Now I'm going to move back to my original title, resistance exercises medicine. I'm going to say medicine just so I can rub it for Professor James longer than I'll get to medical school. But if I had to offer you a single habit that increase your muscle mass, to increase increase the strength of your ligaments and tendons. Insulin resistance, reduce the risk of diabetes. Increase the good ones. You know what I'm saying? Decreases hypertension. What about hypertension disease? Make that into a small tablet. This is resistance to things. How much do you pay for that tablet? A lot. And there's no tablet can, that can do that for exercise and specifically now, it's my, my theoretical part of the presentation. Organizers are going to bring in some really heavy weights. We're going to lift some 20 minutes of the presentation. Just kidding. Thank you very much. Good evening, colleagues. It is indeed a privilege and a, a pleasure for me to be part of this uh, very prestigious moment of the show. Uh, I'd like to thank the Vice Chancellor of the Resident, the Executive Dean of the Dean of Science of Engineering, Professor of the Shaw, in the show. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm not sure I think uh, it would be appropriate for me to undo what Shaw has just managed to convince you that resistance is actually something we should take on going forward. For those of you who uh, might want them, I'm a simple clinical methodologist. Uh, Work, his research work, have shown that they need a need for resistance exercise and training to be viewed as essential and effective component of health organization. I mean, in the last couple of slides, this is not in my mind, but in fact, we should describe recent exercise and training. The benefits that are associated with doing this exercise was particularly important. What came to me was that he actually convinced us that there are more benefits than there are risks. The includes amongst us the ability to, to recover disease very fast, the ability to be able to prevent disease such as diabetes, hypertension, etc. The ability to be able to optimize 
your health status uh, to prevent to be able to manage chronic disease. A lot of you mentioned in the last part of the speech. He also pointed out something that I noticed because I'm a clinician that amongst the healthcare providers, there is always this pitfall that rob exercise is more beneficial to resistant exercise. I think we are uh, very convincingly that in fact that may be uh, just that we probably don't have to back, back the hypothesis that resistant exercise is more beneficial than aerobic exercise. It is my view that uh, now actually start putting resistance exercise into my back of all of the healthcare tools that I carry around uh, as I look after the patients. I look after in my day job, uh, I'm an administrator, like people in front of you here. Um, I spent um, to reach into a condition called hemophilia, which is a bleeding process. A uh, patient bleeding in their job, consequently, they actually draw joints. And one of the prescriptions that we make for our patients is exercise. What I haven't done with consistency is to prescribe as opposed to aerobic exercise. And I'll start doing it going forward. What I can help but is that also in healthcare or market delivery, we have it very to exercise in general, and in particular, the kind of exercise that uh, is now expect on. And, and part of that reasoning, I'm actually trying to defend myself here, is that we always argue that actually no evidence for that. What his colleagues are show uh, research. There is, there is evidence that some of these exercises to be part of our knowledge that we need to pay. The research that our colleagues are doing are probably likely to be a paradigm shift in the way we deliver health, but also, importantly, in the way we manage the patients in our societies. I also believe that with that Professor is called to be, should be showing that in our area, particularly in the career of health we need uh, exercise physiology and other forms of associated uh, uh, terminology in the curricular of professions. I must say that I'm a graduate. The only time I am a Therapy as well as looking at my patients. And um, no, the, the training, 12 years of training I went through, was I ever given a and or content physiotherapy? And yet, you can see from the benefits that in fact, it should be greater in the way we are healthcare professionals. And in fact, it should extend beyond healthcare professionals. I believe it should be uh, part and parcel of lifting uh, uh, the health of the community. Within uh, this province, and we are looking at least three medical schools in the next couple of years to come. And I've not doubt that will be in this course. And I'm hoping that Professor Shaw and like minded professionals will start to see the thought of this kind of research into the curriculum and to start to name. This hormone of delivery into the curriculum you have developed. Also, I want that uh, in the next couple of years, both the funding agencies in South Africa, in particular the funding agency that uh, Professor Shaw and my, uh, myself sit on, the Medical Research Council, are beginning to recalibrate and refocus on where they are going to focus the energies 
and the resources. And, and it seems that like, the reforms is going to move away very slowly from the infectious communicable diseases to the non-communicable diseases. And I've no doubt in my mind that this is opportune time for Professor Shaw and his colleagues to actually grab that opportunity, grab the resources that are available, that are going to be available by the funding agencies and the Department of Health and going forward. And I would like to thank Professor Shaw for sharing your passion today with us and to congratulate you on your role in the global arena in elevating resistance exercise and training to the level and the recognition it deserves. I truly believe it is an underplayed component of healthcare delivery. In your data, uh, through illustrations, you indicated that resistance training and exercise benefits both the old and the young. It benefits those who are it's those who are strong and weak, and needless to say, it benefits male and females. Uh, you made that point very strongly that, um, in fact, resistance is in medicine. Congratulations. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mashangu. I take out of his response is lifting health. <laughs> That's one of the kind of exciting things about your remarks. And I just want to extend sincere gratitude and appreciation to you for elevating this moment um, of ours, a very special moment for us as well before Professor Shaw. Uh, we to extend our gratitude to you and um, as our colleague and friend and um, this is the time to do so this evening. Um, essentially then to uh, Professor Shaw, um, I trust that uh, he has risen to the occasion. Uh, I'm not going to do a poll now. <laughs> uh, uh, it's a bit too late for that. Um, but uh, I trust that um, we have seen here a professor in full swing um, demonstrating um, a commitment to a project and illustrating to us um, both theoretically and statistically um, the case that he has made this evening and uh, I therefore uh, present to you uh, Professor Shaw, and I invite our two colleagues to uh, rope him as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. 